in Asia Minor, in the church at Philippi. There is a statement that forms the basis for my remarks this morning. They're going to be remarked for it. You know, we see these wonderful buildings. And we see our congregations that are so well organized with choirs and instruments and learned the preachers and all that kind of stuff. And we forget that the church started out in little rooms. Where there were no television sets. No Wi-Fi. None of those little tablet things that you stick with. And I watch you all surreptitiously play with them while you were trying to drink sometimes. <laughs> I'm not going to go into all that. But in that letter, Paul says these words to this little church. Philippi. He says, my friends, you have always obeyed not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation. With fear and trouble. In another place, in another church, he writes these words. From him, the wholeheartedly join together, are he wholeheartedly joined together, by every supporting ligament. For every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love so that each part does its work. I thought since this was Labor Day weekend, I might talk a little bit about work. Work fascinates me. I can watch it all day long. All right. The other day I was watching television and they did a reprise of the 1963 march on Washington which occurred 50 years ago this past week. Now a lot of you weren't even a twinkle in your mama's and daddy's eyes at that time. But I remember that occasion. 50 years ago Remember, we'd, we'd sat on a bus all night long with a whole bunch of folks and arrived in Washington about 7 o'clock in the morning. Had been told that the neo-Nazis were going to beat us, that there were some folks from the Klan. Now, we weren't by ourselves. This, is, this was all over the country. People were gathering in March to do the march on Washington. And so we were told that they would all be there. And the army had gathered. There were army troops on the corners. And those ugly vehicles that they had all up and down the streets, and the cops were there. Because they thought there would be violence. Now, I'm not a fan of violence. I run away from it as much as I possibly can. Because I'm a devoted cop. Devoted cop. But sometimes you have to forget your physical comfort and safety and well-being because something else is more important. I know you know that. Make it plain, Doc. Make it plain. So we got on these buses and thought there would be a few of us from here and there. When I got to Washington that morning, I had never seen that many buses. 
I have never seen that many people at the same time. There were people from Spokane, Washington. You know where that is, don't you? That's clear across the other side. People from Yuma, Arizona. People from North Dakota. People from Selma, Alabama. People from Jackson, Mississippi. People from Waco, Texas. White people, black people. I never saw so many different shades of people in my life. Some of them, I don't know what they were. <laughs> That's all right, too. You know, we've been doing that a long time. <laughs> we gathered there in that place. That was 50 years ago. And some of those people from the Carolinas and from Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi were bandaged up. Bandages on their heads, arms in slings, people on canes, people with those big swaddling things that you, and they would go like coming down through there. They had been beat up. They had, you know, sometimes I think if you got killed and it was all over in one instant, it might be better than just having to suffer through all the stuff that people had to suffer through. But they all came. Oh, not, there were people older than dirt. And there were, there were kids as young as, as this little boy here. I've never seen there are that many people, black people, white people, Chinese people, red people, all kinds of people gathered in that place. You know why we were gathered there? Because people needed jobs and people needed the right to participate in the decisions that were being made by their city governments, their state governments, and the national government. That was 50 years ago. What were the issues? Jobs and votes. That's what the March on Washington was about. We'd all gone there from everywhere because we knew that people were broke, they were hungry, they were angry, they were bitter, they were violent, they were upset, they were separated, they were crazy because they didn't have jobs and they did not have the right to vote to create jobs. So we gathered there. And they had asked church people to be there because they felt if church people were there, then maybe we wouldn't have violence with the neo-Nazis and the Klan and all those other folks. That's what we gathered about. And the reason I'm talking about that, and I'm going to talk about it today, because you may not believe it or not, you may not think it this way or not, but Labor Day and labor and work are at their root a spiritual matter. We're never going to get people up in here to sing and shout and speak and do all these things that we're doing if we cannot somehow speak to their need. Never happen if we can somehow speak to their need. Why is that? Well, I'll never forget that. There were magic moments. I was sitting in the shadow of the Washington Monument and they had a makeshift platform built in a kind of meadow down by the Washington Monument. And A. Philip Randolph, who was one of the organizers of the march, mm. that booming voice of his said, ladies and gentlemen, there are now 200,000 Americans gathered in this place. They didn't believe it at first, but it was true. And then there was the Kingston Trio singing 
Uh, what was that song about freedom? I've got a hand, but you need to be the bat. <laughs> and Little Horn went across the stage. You know, Little Horn, so petite and pretty. And she gave one loud freedom and tore the place up. And Odette, wonderful singer, in that voice of hers with that guitar sang, Oh, free. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in that grave and go home to my Lord. Then she said, And I'll be free. Hmm. It was a wonderful morning, but it was a long morning when we were kind of tired. And so Dr. King's speech came at the end of a long prayer. It was a hot day, almost as hot as it is today <laughs> and yesterday. He came and he reminded us that America had not met its promissory note. It had promised that all people were created free and equal and had a right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness, but that they, this country had not lived up to. It was a good speech. It was well delivered and Dr. King spoke in that wonderful, wonderful rhythm that only Southern preachers can do. I can do it. But then there came a moment. Some say later that it was Mahalia Jackson who whispered to him, Martin, tell him about that tree. And Dr. King had given a good speech, but not a memorable speech. It was at that moment when Mahalia, in her own inevitable fashion, said, Martin, He changed, and his, his presentation took on a cadence, took on a rhythm, <laughs> took on a tone, and, and he began to share his dream with all of America. And it was like a revival meeting. People began to cry, and they jumped up and down, and it was something else. It was, a, it was a simple speech, but powerful. He was talking about the necessity of work and the right to the decision-making process. Now, I watched that 50-year reprise the other morning on television, and I wept, remembering. Because you see, the echoes of that moment are still with us. We don't pay too much attention to it, but work defines us. We even, we even call ourselves, sometimes, call ourselves our names, our family names, by the work we do. They're the carpenters. They're the millers. Millers were those who ground the stuff and made them flour and cornmeal and stuff. And chandlers who outfitted the ships that went to sea. Those names had meaning because of their work. Work often defines us. Work not only defines, but it does define who we are because when we get up and go to work, whatever, whether we have the night shift or the day shift or whatever it is, you know, people say to you, what kind of work do you do? Yeah. And they, they get in their mind an image of who you are and the kind of work you do. Yes, sir. And not well, you know, and we think that some work is better than other work. My dad was an automobile mechanic. 
He never went past the sixth grade. And he used to go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and work at 6 o'clock at night, six days a week. He raised nine children, or eight children, one of them died. My dad never said a word about it. I never heard an unpleasant reference, a bad word. Uh, he didn't walk out, stomp out of that house. He would get up every morning and go and work as an automobile mechanic in an unheated garage for 12 hours a day, six days a week because he had a family. And he had to take care of the family. And he never bellyed about it. Never said a word about it. He just did it because that was his work. That defined him. Well, it didn't quite define him. As I said, he never went past sixth grade, but I remember going with him to Detroit to the Chrysler Corporation headquarters a couple of times because my dad, could, he could read a schematic like nobody's business. And the field engineers, when they had a problem with those Dodge and Plymouths and Chrysler, would call them and they asked my dad to come up there and help them solve it's not, the, it, it doesn't matter how many years you go to college or high school or whatever. That's not what it's about. I know some people that have more degrees than I have on the road. them out on my arm. Doesn't mean anything. It's what you know and what you share and what you do that really counts. That's, that's why Labor Day is important. Because you know, most now, not all of us, but probably most of us have to work. We, we get out there, I even have to, now you may not think so, but I've had to work in my life. I remember when I first started out college, I had a wife and a baby. At that point we had faith there and we lost this, she wasn't even around yet. But we used to have to get up, I got up at 5.31 and went down, and help to unload crates of vegetables and things and come back home, take a shower, and eat breakfast, and then go back to college to go to work. So I wouldn't have to do that all of my life. But you know, you have to do what you got to do in order to make things work. And it doesn't matter. Work is important. You may not be a teacher. You may not be a professional. You may not be somebody who works at Lilly. You may not be in, say, a public servant. You may, may not be in one of these corporations. But you work, and that is important. That's what this day is all about. Because if you don't work, then how do you define yourself? How do you define yourself if you don't work? Who are you if you don't work? If all you're doing is taking it in, Labor Day is about working people, not people of privilege, but people who give effort and sweat and energy to put bread on the table and a roof overhead, and sometimes not even that. But they do it because they have to. You do it. Some of you I know, not everybody in here is making hundred thousand dollars a year. You're working hard because you have to work. You gotta keep these things going or else we cannot, we cannot live. The reason we have so many dangerous people is because when we do not work. We don't define ourselves as important. It hasn't always been easy to be a working person in this country. People have to work at whatever wage somebody wanted to give them. As long as they wanted them to work. And they had to work whether they liked it or not. And it wasn't until the 30s. That, as a matter of fact, one of the leaders was from Indiana, a fellow named Eugene Debs, over in Terre Haute, Indiana. 
will help people to get to understand that if you get together and you have a common purpose and a common desire and a common commitment, you can make things. We don't believe it. I don't think we believe it because we don't like it a lot of the times. But you know, if a church gets itself together and has a common sense of what it's about and has a common commitment to what it's about, it can make a difference. That's why this church makes a difference. When, when Barnes is at its best, it makes a difference. Labor Day is about people who sweat and put effort into making life better. You know, now we have these days, these so grand offices at that march in Washington, and now there are people now think that unions are passing. We don't need unions anymore. Things have changed. But you better look out. There are those who would like for us to return to how it was before. Watch out! You may have two pork chops ahead in your icebox, two pairs of shoes, but you better watch out. There's a woman in New York by the name of, I better put my glasses on because I wrote this note on here and I want to be sure to get her name right. Her name? Is Mayo Wiley. She wrote an article in uh, the Washington Spectator, which is a, is a, a, a paper that I get every week or so. In last week's paper, she said, you know, we better, we better not forget that while we think change, things have changed a lot, they haven't. That 50%, 56% of Americans have a negative attitude towards race. And that, I got it back where 51% had a negative attitude on race, and 56% thought that Obama should never be president. They think that that's a poll that was taken just recently. Our prisons are full because we have deluded our folks into thinking that they have to have stuff without working for it. Or that it's so important that they've got to steal it or beat somebody up for it or kill somebody for it. What, what happens to us? What happens to people? It isn't just us. I mean, it's the whole attitude of this nation. Yes, yes. That the more you, how do we even say? How do we describe people? We say, how much is he worth? How much is she worth? What kind of attitude is that to measure the humanity of another individual? By how much or little they have. Yes, you yes. don't know, but that that sweaty, smelly young person walking down the street might look like that and act like that because they've been working hard. Yeah. Not because they are ignorant and idle and no good. Yeah. I know this isn't the sermon you all want to hear, but it's the truth. It's all right. It's all right. And I'll tell you the reason why it's important. Yes, sir. Because at its base, yeah. all of work is spiritual. Yes, sir. The first temptation of Jesus was when the devil said to him, make these stones be great. He wanted Jesus to do a work. And Jesus reminded him something that church folk forget all the time. And that is that people do not live by bread. living 
rather than what you got or what you were. It's who you are that counts. And if you're a child of God, if you recognize who you are, you are somebody. You may not have anything, but you're somebody. I'm going to quit here in a minute. Let me get through this. Jesus' response was that we don't live by bread alone. But it does raise the focusing question that I want to ask you this morning. Whether you're young or old, rich or poor, whatever you are. What are you working for? Alright. What are you working for? Are you working so you can retire and take it easy? You may not even live that long. unless you're doing something. So what are you working for? What is your purpose? What is your direction? Where are you going? Well, I'll tell you, Paul was talking to these folks in that little church and reminded them and reminded us that as long as we're working for something that matters, something that has value, something that means something to other people, then you are doing the work of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not songs and churches and pretty things like this. The kingdom of God is giving a drink of water to somebody that needs it. jobs and we march to vote. But I'll tell you something else. We're marching. When we give somebody that piece of bread, we're marching. Hmm. When we give somebody a shoulder to cry on, we're marching. Yes, when we try to give somebody who doesn't have anything yet a piece of bread, we're marching. We're marching, we're building, we're marching toward a city. Not like Washington, we marched on Washington, D.C. But I'm talking about another march. I'm talking about a march toward a city called Zion. Yes. I'm yes. talking about a march toward a city where all the yes. is over, where folk are rich in love and rich in health and rich yes. in the presence of God. the throne. Yes. Let those refuse to sin yes. who never knew our God. Yes. We're children of the heavenly king yes. and we will shed our songs abroad. Yes. So, let's see now, what is that other thing that I want to say? Oh yeah. To let every tear be dry and every, every trouble shed we're, well, here it is. And every eye be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground yeah. to fairer worlds. <laughs> All high. Call me that love the Lord. Let your joys be yours. Join in the song of sweet accord and thus surround the throne. We're marching. Yes, sir. We're marching. Yes.
Amen. 